All right, this is the beginning of the recording of Saturday, November 2nd, and this is the Islands of Sanity in a Mad World course, and this is the first of two Saturdays in November of 2024 that we're um, going to be involved with, and um, this, of course, is a 13-month course from September 2024 to September 2025. And um, this is one of two one-hour classes or sessions that we do on these Saturdays in each of the months. Usually, this first hour-long session is leaning toward the information or the experience that we have had individually about um, the book that we're reading in this time. And there'll be a series of books in this year. And our first one is Climate Cure from Jack Adam Weber. We'll be getting there in just a moment. And hopefully some more people will join us. We know that we've got a number of people who are offline really all the time, and they just watch the recordings. But Janet, you were just summarizing a little bit of what it's like to live in Canada so close to the USA in these uh, rather unusual times, shall we say. Uh, this is an unusual amount of diplomacy I'm deploying here. Um, and you were just kind of summarizing it in a cool way. So would you mind reviewing a little bit for us? And what have, where have you landed with regard to your neighbors down south? <laughs> well, that's that's uh, funny because it it is interesting to live immediately to the north shared borders so our, our country and our economics and our culture is so close you know like like I've often thought of Canada and probably the world thinks of Canada as like the United States' little sister or something um, but my viewpoint from here I think I was saying is like I'm living in a house and I can look into the window of the neighbor's house mm. and see what's going on, but I'm not in it yet unless it spills out of the house onto the street and into the neighborhood. Um, and what I find alarming is that the United States seems to have gone crazy. Um, there's so much irrational um, stuff going on, like the government has somehow created the hurricanes that devastated the southeastern states like what mm -hmm. um and th there's just you know there's so much violence and anger and fighting and and yet the individual americans i know through you know organizations like this or um whatever i, I don't know them personally but I know them like I know you, are almost without exception, lovely people. And I've found this really puzzling that the country as a whole can be nuts, um, to use a colloquial term. Mm -hmm. um, and yet individual people aren't. Well, I have a couple of exceptions. And, and that is where I've come to my idea that um, that somehow there's been a hypnosis happen and that everyone sort of goes along until there's some kind of trigger word that sets off the part that was hypnotized into this woohoo stuff, you know, like the hypnotist who, you know, gets somebody on stage and hypnotizes them and they go along and they think they're fine until there's a word comes up and then they start barking like a dog 
<laughs> and they don't know it and they don't know how it happened. Yes. But there you go. And, and that's how this feels like a bit to me that. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, my experience is you don't know who's got that trigger. So I could be talking to someone online and I'll hit that trigger and all of a sudden there's this irrational stuff being spewed out and I'm like, oh, good heavens. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's what it's like sitting up here, um, being very afraid for your country and what's going to happen, mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen to individual people, what's going to happen to your culture and the spill over to the rest of the world yeah. um, and us being so close and being so connected. Right. Uh, so I, and I, I don't want to insult people and yet that's what the outside world is seeing. So um, anyway, that's a longer version of what we were talking about. Really, yeah, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of the inside world here is seeing it that way too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't feel quite so judgmental then. But. Yeah. Oh boy. You know, it's um, there's a. I think there are many threads of profound seeing and truth in what you're saying. Uh, you know, kind of your gut feeling about this trigger word and who exactly has who who. Who's this, who's the hypnotist, and how is it that they're installed? These words are installed, and it, this there are a number of threads that I'd love to pursue if we could sit down with a, a long day long cup of tea and you know really really uh, hash it out. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I um I just want to validate that particular point that um. In a, with next month, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in the what we've colloquially called, start to call the mental body, as if each of our the main components that make up our way of being in the world, perceiving the world and presencing ourselves in the world could be called bodies. You know, we have our physical body and then we have a feeling body or the emotions part of us. And that has its own way of centering, like our physical body has a center as well. And there's this, the, the next one that we're going to be talking about <clears throat> is the mental body. It also has a center. And uh, I often call the process of coming back to center in the mental body sense-making. How do I make sense of this world? And one part of that exploration for me was, is that thread that you just brought up, how is it, how is this narrative that we really need to be a culture with any coherence, we need narratives to be able to, to make sense of daily life for ourselves. How does government work? How does culture work? How does politics work? And so on. Each of these things are narrative. And uh, for more than a hundred years now, there's been it's it's far more than a hundred years that things like propaganda and and kind of rustic early versions of control of cultural narratives, national narratives, and so on. So it's it's not brand new to the 20th century by any stretch. But when it started to become weaponized, when it really took off to the unbelievable extent that it is now. It was already powerful when Edward Bernays and others created public relations, created what it is to market to people so that you can have them consume more and more because that's what this culture is about. And I'm pointing to the land I'm on, the USA, because we more or less birthed it into the world and forced everybody else to have that same narrative. And um, it's very much my impression and has been throughout my whole life, actually, that there, this control of the narrative is what is taking us down. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as, and I'm sure that um, uh, Ian McGilchrist, uh, a research psychiatrist who's incredibly prolific, massive books that he puts out, he has really yeah, right, not multiple <laughs> volumes that big. Yes, yeah. Um, he has articulated the individual version of the hemispheres of the brain and how they want to be in a different relationship with one another. They're both very important. They both have jobs to do and they do them quite well. But we evidently have the wrong hemisphere of our brain running the show. It's the one that looks like our global extractionist self-terminating culture and all the features thereof. And the other one that is supposed to be running the show is the one that is able to see the context of things, mm -hmm. the relatedness of things, the subtleties of the nuance of things. The other side, the left hemisphere in this case, is what has, creates competition, zero-sum competition, uh, a highly narrowed and intense focus instead of that broader focus that, and contextual focus and relational focus of the right hemisphere. So... Um, we'll be exploring those pieces when we get to be talking about that mental body, that sense-making apparatus that for most of us is scrambled. It's, it's just completely ripped apart. Mm -hmm. And that's the craziness. I, I absolutely would, would have used the same words that you had just used to describe the USA. We are insane. And that's literally the foundation upon which Islands of Sanity in a Mad World was created. With an opening question of, is, is the world insane? And because I happen to live here, I can ask this next question, is the USA insane? And of course, it's... <laughs> It's self-evident, but at least it gets the conversation going. Mm -hmm. So I really want to thank you for your looking, your seeing, uh, your sharing, and and please keep it up. I I think what I'd like to do is is give all three of us a chance to very briefly check in, and uh, I'd like us to just add a little piece of what we did last month, which is just a start of the exploration of the feeling body. And we shared with one another a little bit about what our inner scanning yielded in terms of, is there a, a particular core feeling that's been present for us in this, say, say since we saw each other last, like a couple of weeks ago? And one that you could just tell us a bit about. And uh, even though sometimes it can feel a little stiff or awkward, I would like to ask us to share what percentage of this feeling that you've noticed that you'd like to share with us a little bit about that you've experienced in these past couple of weeks, what percentage of your capacity was showing up when whatever it is you're going to share with us, when you, you know, when, when that was occurring and you're looking back and remembering that moment or those moments, how much of your capacity of anger or fear or sadness or joy, how much of your capacity was taken up by that moment why is it is it a you know it's got to be a considerable amount because it's important enough for you to share right <laughs> so i'm uh hopefully not over talking it let me uh just give you a very brief check-in i'll happy to model a brief check-in with a little bit of flavor from the feeling body in my past couple of weeks mm. all right 
and of course I'm Dean from Southern Oregon and um, all right to brief check in um, I I've actually been doing very very well I know that there's been some joy there's been some uh, some fear sm smaller amount of fear um, smaller amount of anger and um uh, And a larger amount, the, the um, particular core feeling I'd like to s speak just a little bit more about, share a little bit more about, is sadness or grief. And I've, I've started to touch into what is a backlog of grief that I, I know that I've mentioned in prior sessions with us, that there's only so much that I can titrate. And I don't know if you'll recall... Um, Jack Adam Weber in his book, Climate Cure, which this is supposed to be a focus on this hour. <laughs> uh, Jack does a beautiful job of, of really making it clear that we, we need to just bite off as much as we have capacity for to process because these core feelings can be overwhelming given these times. The waves that come through my system and come out of my system are just stunningly huge. And I know that I can't handle any one of them fully. I need to be adept at sh consciously shelving it for the moment. This isn't overriding it. This isn't like denying it. This isn't suppressing it forever. This is just finding a space where I can have some people to sit in circle with and and they can hold space for me. So I got that. And uh, about that sadness. And the sadness is is about a number of things that are going on on the planet that seem to have no resolution. In fact, they seem to be accelerating and intensifying all to the detriment of all Earth systems and the vast majority of human systems. And the ones that are easy to point out and talk about are the Uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is just, to me, right on the edge of a world war kind of level. That's staggering enough. That That's more of a fear reaction that I have with that, and I did not spend much time with that possibility. What I spent my, um, my uh, circle time feeling was the uh, extraordinary grief of that I, I believe that I'm watching on YouTube and TikTok <laughs> the decimation of a culture, uh, a genocide. I've never seen that so vividly. And it is, uh, I'm just slowing down intentionally right now. I'm dropping into more of a direct experience of my own body and my own feeling right now just for a moment with you. So I want you to know that that's been active for me. And I would say that I've been about um, 80% of my capacity to grieve at any one time in those circles that I've been in since I've seen you last. And again, just, just slowing down my speaking and my breathing right now, I'm feeling the tears... <laughs> Yeah, the waves are there all the time, wanting to be felt. And so even with this brief moment, uh, they they want to come out. <laughs> so thank you for holding space. I appreciate it. And that's me checking in since we've seen each other last with a brief emphasis on one, one core feeling that I had uh, present for me. Uh, would either of you like to go next? share what's so for you sure yeah thank you well i'm richard from uh central texas at least that's where i live right now i don't really feel like very at home in this state but uh here i am um yeah i mean the last two weeks have been it's just so bizarre living in this country right now i mean it's not even the state i mean the state is crazy enough but 
the country as a whole is so crazy, like you were saying. Um, on a feeling level, I, I really feel intensely worried. I mean, I don't know if that's actually a feeling. Um, worry is kind of a mental state, but uh, yeah, feelings that go with it. I mean, there's feelings that go with it of fear, anxiety, sadness. Beautiful. Yes. You know, I mean, all those things, fear, anxiety, sadness, are really intense right now for me. And, um, you know, when you were talking about what, we're, what was going on in our feeling body, I had this image of, um, I feel like, this whole country, I mean, and me with it, it's like we're teetering on the edge of this cliff and we might, we might fall off and we might recover and, you know, get back to our standing position on the edge of the cliff or something. But in the meantime, we don't know what's happening. We don't know if we're falling or staying put or what's going to happen. And, you know, so it feels very, very scary, actually. Um, So, um, would, uh, Richard, would you would you mind um, offering us a, a sense of what what amount of your capacity for that yeah. fear or that anxiety or other right. things that you had? Could you tell us about how how much of your capacity felt like it was full? Yeah, I was just I was just going to go there actually. Oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, so. I'm really, I'm really trying my best to let myself experience all these feelings. And I say I'm probably letting myself experience like, you know, maybe 75% of, of the fear and definitely feeling the anxiety. And I mean, even to the point of, And I'll just say this openly. I, I have some weapons, some guns that I bought many, many years ago, and I haven't paid any attention to them for years. And I started cleaning them and getting ready to learn how to use them again because I totally forgot. Mm. I hate that. I hate that I'm in this position. I don't want to do that. And yet at the same time, my partner's disabled. She can't defend herself. If anybody defends us, it's going to be me. if it comes down to violent confrontations with idiots with uh, AR-15s or whatever weapons they have. So, you know, I'm getting ready to defend us if, if necessary. And I, I hate that, but I'm, I'm still doing it. So, uh, you know, I don't like that at all. Um, but, yeah, that. so, you know, I'm letting myself feel all this and start to, respond yeah. with a rational kind of response of like, you know, having more food in the house or having, you know, bottling up some water, you know, having some water stores available. Cause I don't expect society to just fall apart, but the way things are going in this country, it's actually a possibility. I mean, it's a possibility that things could get really violent really fast and things could fall apart. I mean, we don't know that they won't. So yeah. I hate that, but that's where we are. Yeah. Um, that's it. So yeah, it's it's a very tough time, and you know I'm dreading this damn election, and yeah. I I don't see a good outcome no matter what happens. I mean, I think people are going to go nuts no matter what happens, basically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not um, not real optimistic about it in the short term. I mean, meaning the next few months. You know. Yes. Yeah. It's Richard, thank you. I I sure appreciate it. That's. Uh... Clear. I just in there for a sec. Um, hmm. Richard, you aren't alone in in being a normal, kind, caring person who's feeling like they need to acquire weapons in case something in their neighborhood becomes that dangerous. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things that really told me in the summer how anxious people are that nice people feel like they need a gun in their house just in case yep. and people who would normally never do that and that in fact i'm getting chills now mm -hmm. just thinking 
like, you know, like it could be that you feel like it's too dangerous to go to the store to get food. Not necessarily that there's a war in the streets, but you get, and anyway, yeah. so I just wanted to validate that for you, that you're not alone in I'm sure I'm not. Feeling, feeling that threatened. And it's possible a lot of people don't want to talk about it because yeah. you also don't want to advertise to your neighbors who's right. stocking on food and who's got a weapon and like, because that just heightens the anxiety yeah. and can also make you a target. And all of this thinking for me, oh yeah, it feels like science fiction. Yeah. Uh, any rate, so that that's enough. But I, yeah. uh, my heart goes out to both of you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Jenna, would you mind just continuing on into your own check-in and sharing about a core feeling you've been wrestling with? Um, my biggest thing is grief. Mm -hmm. Um. And just grief for so much uh, destruction, uh, destruction of living systems, of biodiversity, of animals, of the oceans, of people, cultures. What's going on in the Middle East absolutely is a deliberate attempt to wipe a culture off the face of the earth. And the and I mean, that's happened over the centuries, but what totally raises the hair on the back of my neck is that it's the Jewish people who were, there was an attempt to genocide them mm -hmm. like 75 years ago. And I, I just, you can see me, my head goes, what? Um, have you learned nothing about mm -hmm. greater humanity? Right. Anyway, and and so my uh, uh, capacity for, I I think that I could feel enough that I'd be on my knees with my head over my hands, mm -hmm. crying and wailing is how it it feels, and um, it's like what you're saying about um, Jack's book is that there's a point where you go I I can't do that like i'll i'll be mm -hmm. i'll be stopped in my life if i feel that and the picture that i get is i every once in a while i get into watching the youtube videos about the tsunami from the earthquake that hit japan i think it was 2011 mm -hmm. anyway that massive tsunami that just hit the coast and you watch those huge waves crash in on their coast and some people are prepared up on hills and tall buildings but so many people weren't and this is what this feels like that that what if i'm someone on the street watching this 30 foot wave coming and falling on buildings and people and animals and, and trees and just wiping mm -hmm. everything out as it goes inland. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these videos, mm -hmm. but they're, um, they're, and, and so that's how this feels for me, yeah. um, is that there's this horrifically awful stuff in process getting worse um, I, I try to hold it because I believe there's a need to witness. Um, and at the same time, ah, uh, how much do you witness? And, and so the other thing I wanted to say about me being on these calls, knowing that they're being recorded, knowing that who knows who down the road could be watching this, and I'm not I think I'm generally kind of private. I certainly don't have anybody in my personal life that I would say much of this to. But my feeling, deep feeling, is that this is not a time to be small with your values. Mm. That this, if you're going to put yourself 
into the world and say, this is who I am and I don't agree. Mm. This is the time to do it. And um, it's, it's not a time to hoard your care. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm putting myself out here to the world, you could say, because this is how deeply I believe that it needs to be put out there. Um, so, so that's, that's me. I'm, 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 I, I write a lot and I'm trying to, you know, it's like I said, when I joined this beautiful day in Ontario, sun shining, I still have a couple of maple trees with yellow leaves. It's crisp and cool. And, and I just feel I need to absorb that and hold it as an antidote to um, all of these other things that I have no control over. And I can't stop the genocide. Right. Um, and anyway, so that's me. Um, yeah. And, and like I said, my heart goes out to the two of you and, and everyone else in the States who's um, and around the world who, who's feeling terrorized and, and, demolished by forces outside of their control yes so really thank you both for uh really jumping in with both feet into this check-in you know for me this simple opening exercise in a thousand zoom calls and before that i i, I can recall when we actually sat face to face with people you know that's how old i am yeah. <laughs> but there's this um uh, yeah there's this uh, just beauty to how quickly if we if we want to if we if we let ourselves as you just so beautifully articulated janet if we let ourselves just open our heart and and i'm very moved by by your stand hmm. to not be small me too i um during the break between these two sessions i'm going to find a quote from my mentor with uh, regard to all things soul and grief he's my mentor for those things hmm. and he has a, a a quote that would be a good fit with your stand so i'll, I'll find that but I, I just for sure want to take this moment to acknowledge that is rare. I wish it wasn't rare, but it's so rare to hear someone who's usually a bit introverted, a bit quieter, a bit, bit more reserved, which I am also. And you... You are taking an extraordinary human stand to have a large expression, a large presence, because that's what's called for now. That's what's calling you out now from your, in your world, in your experience. And it is so deeply inspiring to hear you say those words. And so thank you. Yeah, it is. I don't know that the, there's anything else we can do yes. that is more essential and more important in the human sphere than to take the stand that is alive for each of us, whatever that is. Mine will be different than yours. So bless your heart and thank you very much. Well, th and thank you for creating a space to do that. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I know that in my personal life, the people I know, if I get anywhere close to this, they will literally turn their heads away. They do not want to touch the level of fear and anxiety that I think they know is there. And that kind of left leaves me going, 
what do I do with it other than even in my private space, try to move with um, uh, that level of compassion. Um, even if I'm by myself walking my dog to try and have that around me as a, is a state of being and I don't know how else to explain it and I don't do it very well all the time um, but it does feel like it's in a lot of circumstances the only thing I can do right. and and hope that that energy touches something somewhere yes Richard it seems like you wanted to to jump in and and I want you to do that, but I, I'm just going to take a, a one little extra moment to ride this wave a little further with you, Janet. Oh yeah. Uh, this this space and your stand that we're talking about here. This is such a uh, for me an immense cornerstone of what this work is about. Certainly in my experience, and evidently in yours. And I wanted to just speak to not only us here on the screen, but anyone who does this work, this particular course and so on, is watching this a year from now or next week or whatever. This is the space that I was pointing to back in September in the very first session and the first course material. There was this kind of odd piece that I was asking people to check out which is about creating our own story. Hmm. That there's an expression that is available to us and seems like a natural occurrence for many people is to relate to this, this story of someone finding a way to engage with something larger than themselves. That sometimes is called a hero's journey it sometimes is just the kind of story that inspires us. It's, and most often these days, that's in film. And that's what that piece of course material was, was a guy who's an expert at doing exactly that. He co collates, he curates uh, elements from different films to make something more vivid for us rather than some sort of abstract conversation. And because we can relate to the movies we've seen, we know how they make us feel. And so he invites us to, to pick and choose and create our own story. And to me, that's what makes the hero's journey, the hero's journey is what that person has stood up and said, I stand for this. I'm getting goosebumps just saying that. Mm -hmm. So thank you uh, for letting me just add that little piece. And if anybody who's watching or any of you two have not watched that piece back in September's course materials about the hero's journey and creating our own story, I think it would be a fabulous addition. So a suggestion. Thank you again. And Richard, I'm curious if you had anything that you would like to add to the conversation after Janet has spoken so vividly. It seemed like you got kind of uh, engaged in there for a while. So I just wondered. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I really, you know, felt it you know, very strongly <clears throat> what you said, what you both said, uh, you know, about standing in our truth or standing what we're standing for and, you know, being being there fully. Uh, that's really what I'm aiming to do. Um, not very easy a lot of the time, as you both know, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's, a, it's just a tough time. It's it's very strange, very strange time. Um, well, I just wanted to share with you both, this relates to what we're talking about. I was thinking in the shower this morning, it just popped into my head, 
the, you know, we're working on the things that I'm working most on accepting the things that are hardest for me to accept. And so I actually just wrote down this title. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. Okay. Yeah. The hardest things to accept are usually the most painful. So, um, anyway, I'm not, you know, that's just a, tentative title that came, I came up with, but, you know, I mean, the focus really is like, wow, I mean, there's so much going on in the world that's so painful and, and just so hard to accept. And I mean, I hear people talk about collapse acceptance, and I, I've even written about it myself, collapse acceptance, but I mean, who, is anybody really there? I mean, truly? accepting all this insane shit that we're going through it's so hard i mean it's just i just find it so hard to accept and so i'm that's what i'm thinking of writing next is really exploring that issue it's like wow you know all these things are so painful what are the hardest things what are the most painful things and what are the things that are hardest to accept and really looking at that because you know i feel like i'm yeah kind of on, on this plateau where i'm talking about accepting a lot of these things, but I'm not really there. I'm not really accepting them yet. It's, it's so hard. I mean, I just find it really, uh, that's a huge challenge, you know? Yes. So that's where I go with what we're talking about. It's like, there's, it's just so overwhelming and there's so many painful things happening. It's like, and I mean, there's a hierarchy of painful things, but they're all painful, you know? Uh, there's some good things too, of course, but you know, right now, for me at least, the painful things are much more in the forefront. Yes, Richard, there's something that again just resonated for me that I'd like to underscore a little bit. Um, there's a honesty, there's a vulnerability in how you just self-disclosed. Hmm. and and um you know you basically told some truth that is a little could be a little awkward to say or difficult to say um certainly it might be for me and i think that's also one of the cornerstones of what we really need to be building out in our in our own systems like to be able to have a circle that we can sit in, that we can share that which matters most to us. And we can actually tell the truth about our capacity at any given time. You know, because this is not a culture in which anybody discloses their weaknesses uh, voluntarily. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the places where they might need support or the places where they're not feeling capable or or you get the idea so it just um yeah really thank you for your ongoing you know literally every time you're here it's woven into when you share and that is just telling the truth about how it is right now in your system in your body in your feeling body you know what you're actually grappling with and what you actually have the capacity for that's why we do that silly exercise of talking about a specific feeling and yeah. then this percentage of my capacity i'm talking about percentage and it's like again kind of awkward or stiff or you know odd to put it in those words but there's i guess i'm asking y'all to trust me at this kind of basic level that we're at about learning about the feeling body and expressing of it and holding space for it, that there's a such a gift if we learn that shorthand, if in two minutes we can check in and somebody sitting across from us can have a, a very vivid read on how we're doing. In two minutes, I can convey a, a lot about this complex reality in here. So thank you for that. Beautiful. Well, I'm, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to 
be honest with you two and yeah. share what's really going on. Because like, you know, like you've been saying, not too many people can really uh, handle it, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with y'all's permission, we got a, just a little over 10 yeah. minutes on this particular session. Yeah. And I would like to just recap a bit, uh, especially for the folks who are watching the recordings and may not have this kind of live interaction available. And that's, I know that's a challenge to stay engaged and to, uh, to have it be the, have your experience of the recordings be nearly as vivid as this is in my experience of us live. Um, so about this climate cure book from Jack Adam Weber and why I've chosen it to be the first book in the series of books that we'll be going through in this course is um, it's particularly real for me now, given everything the three of us have spoken about in our, just in this checking in, there are certain elements that he articulates so beautifully that have been present through each of our sharing time in this time. And so there's skill sets that, that can be kind of subtle. Like we, gosh, I never thought about that as a skill set, but okay. And this ability to generate a sense of trust or coherence in, even though this is an online environment, I feel a tremendous amount of coherence between us all. And I feel an immense amount of trust, which is a rare commodity in my experience these days. So I don't take either of those for granted. And I, I'm just thrilled that we are, we, we all bring what we bring, but we also are building this together, building these capacities out. Um. There are a couple of other emphases that I'd like to just remind folks who are watching this recording and ourselves that um, a big part of this work is to get us out of our heads a good, goodly amount of the time because our cultures, even in Canada, <laughs> spend an awful lot of time in our heads and we don't spend much time really feeling mm -hmm you know, at the level that we've been sharing today, for instance. So there's an embodied emphasis. And each month there will be course material available for you to dive into if you want to, to just get a good taste. And you may have a lot of embodied practices. And God bless you. I, I hope you will share about your practices that work for you. This is definitely meant to be a group sharing environment of those resources. So, for instance, in September, I included a, a Jack Adam Weber video, which he came to one of the in early versions of this introductory work in Living Resilience. And he did a long session of the ba most basic self-regulation skills. We've all got a few of them, but he took us through a long list of them. And it's almost like shopping. You can, you know, it's not expected that you would do a 90 minute self-regulation practice every day. You know, you'll, you'll shop for the ones that work for you and they're easy enough to remember or jot down notes about and keep a flow going and so on. So I would invite everyone watching to remember that this uh, embodied focus each month is is there for a reason. Um, I find a small fraction of the difference made by the embodied work. The embodied work is such a huge contribution to our actual experience together. If it's happening in my body and I'm enhancing with each session, I'm enhancing my ability to be present in my body with my feelings and so on. That's the real deal. To just read about it 
or even to just watch the video, not so much. And to do neither of those and then come and hang out on screen, it's just this tiny fraction of the actual w body wisdom that's possible if we actually do some practices. So I'm saying it this way to hopefully entice people, if you don't have an embodied practice, to allow yourself to start to build one out, build two or three of them out, M vary them during the week, okay. do, th do this in the way that works for you. But to have a, an ongoing focus on some, to some degree, on embodied experience of each of these elements. So in the early, the there you go. Uh, October sessions, you might remember if you've watched that piece, um, the embodied piece from October was uh, Stacy Haynes, who's a remarkable facilitator uh, with an Aikido based um, which is a martial art that's quite extraordinary. And uh, she comes from a basis of that, a grounding in that, uh, to do extraordinary facilitation work with people. And that's a more active, and you can actually you know, follow her in those exercises, and you may want to just watch that, I don't know, five-minute piece that she does those physical exercises, they are vivid uh, exercises for reclaiming center. So kind of uh, one step up and more active from the Jack Adam Weber basics. I call them first aid level uh, resilience skills or self-regulation skills. So um, I will be posting uh, another of uh, a, a more embodied and a more active kind of practice for us in uh, the, between these two Saturdays. So I invite you to dive in and keep diving into Stacy's in particular um, if you're so inclined. The last thing I'd, I'd mention, because we're going to be, before you know it, we're going to be to the end, you know, next Saturday will be our last time that we're specifically speaking about Jack Adam Weber's book. Oh. And I just, it doesn't mean that you can't keep going back and keep diving into the things that, that are really resonate for you. My goodness, there is so much. We literally could just stay with that book all year. Easy. Oh, yeah. easy. So I, I would ask, for you to um, sharpen your skills, even if you've got really good skills at uh, being able to find your way and find the pieces, the exercises, the distinctions in a book as rich and as varied uh, as uh, Jack's, to make a point of finding a couple of exercises each month, maybe from here out, to just do a little bit of that journaling. I know that you both do a lot of writing and yay, it's great. You know, it's, right. journaling has been a something I've struggled with and many people I speak with or work with, it's a hard thing for them. Yeah. It certainly was hard for me until I wrote my one and only book. Yeah. That, that kind of cracked me open and and I I can't not engage that way in in my own processing. Mm. So um, in, you know, kind of as a wrap up for this session of speaking about Jack Adam Weber's climate cure, we're going to be going um, next time. There's a, one of the larger final chapters in Jack's book is about our relationship with each other. You know, he, he has some lovely focus going on in various chapters. And this is one that is particularly near and dear to my heart. 
because there's such a fabric of relatedness in my experience of being a human being. And that so this is where it really lives for me. It's just me. You may have it different. I don't know. One thing I would just like to bring our attention to is the, the actual chapters that are appropriate timing-wise for, for now that we would have perhaps spent a bit more time with today <laughs> yeah. is uh, grief. We actually covered a decent part of that neighborhood. That was a really good, good start. And we will go deeper with grief as the months tick by. We will. Yeah. I would also like to ask you to, uh, if you have the space for it, please take a look at his brief chapter, his brief mention of shadow, shadow work. I believe yeah. it's chapter seven. It's the one right after grief. It's yeah. either on, it's on one side or the other of the grief chapter. And, yeah, it's after. It's after. Yeah, and I'm. Uh, I've had a. I'm ten years into this work now, and this has been an evolutionary process of how to offer this introductory work, and then get to greater and greater levels of systems awareness, and and uh, as Richard was saying, acceptance is is itself a process to get to that as as fully engaged in in acceptance as possible, and I experience us to be living in a world driven by shadow, ruled by shadow, controlled by shadow, infused with shadow. And yet it is perhaps our weakest suit, certainly in the USA. Really? We are so not self-aware at the level of our shadow-driven, self-terminating culture. You know, the stakes could not be higher. Yeah. And I think that there is a good introduction to shadow and, and heightening our own individual self-awareness. So I would like to invite not only the three of us, but anyone watching the recording to spend a little time with Jack Adam Weber's Climate Cure. And I, I think you said it was after, Richard. Is that right? The that the the shadow yeah it's it's after the chapter yeah, right after. after the grief chapter yeah great so yeah. if if you have the space to do that and um, give yourself an opportunity to do that I I promise it will be valuable also as a thread we will carry for the rest of the year together uh, perhaps we'll have more to speak about that next Saturday. The, the next Saturday that we will be together. Yeah, two weeks, yeah. Um, because, of course, here in the States, we will have had our election, and perhaps we'll have a shadow or two to speak about at that time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure we will. Yeah. So, um, really, for the two of you, thank you so much. This has been a, a remarkable um, session. I there's Sometimes I get just blown away by how deeply I can feel coherence and connection with people, even in a one hour session. Would, would both of you be willing to just say a sentence or two about what you're landing with after this session? Well, I feel, I feel that, you know, strong sense of coherence also and appreciation for you too. Um, well, you know, I mean, no matter how many times I talk with my wife about these things or talk with friends about these things, it's always it always feels really good to share on a deep level with other people who are in a similar place and can kind of get what I'm talking about. And so, you know, I feel sort of this paradoxical sense of you know, happiness and satisfaction at the same time that we're talking about all this really painful stuff, you know. So I guess I'm landing with kind of holding both, you know, the painful stuff and the and the happiness too. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Richard. 
it it takes bravery to do that um you know it's like to step out of the part of you that wants to protect yourself it, it takes courage and bravery um so kudos to both of you um and you <laughs> yeah well and and yes and like i said i'm i'm the neighbor in the house next door right um, so that this particular thing there will be a ripple effect for me but i'm i'm not going to have the boulder landing right yeah. in the middle of my life so yeah um, Yeah, there's, there's a sense of uh, ease, it's, it's some mm -hmm. some tension having been eased because of being able to speak a deeper yeah. truth than I can to other people and to hear your tru truths um, mm -hmm. is also comforting. Um, yeah. And, and validating. So thank you both. <laughs> yeah. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And I'm curious, will I be seeing both of you at the bottom of the hour for the second yep. session? Yep. yep. Fantastic. I look forward to seeing you there. And uh, have a lovely break. <laughs> you too. See you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>